Ready to begin? Yes. So I'll do the introduction. Yeah. All set. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Judith Lynn, Professor and Chief of Vascular Surgery from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, Chair of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Surgery at McLaren Greater Lansing. As we promote Venus Disease Awareness Month, I would like to welcome you to this Midwestern Vascular Surgical Society webinar on management of complex venous disease. Also, I would like to thank Cook Medical as a sponsor of our MVSS webinar tonight. Before we introduce the speakers, please note the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. To submit your question to our presenter, click on the button and open the Q&A window, type your question, then click on the submit button. The moderators and other attendees will see your questions and the moderator will select questions that will be answered by our presenters. The Q&A segment of tonight's webinar will occur at the conclusion of the fourth presentation but we encourage you to submit your question at any time during the presentation. And tonight, I have the distinct honor to co-moderate this session with Dr. Carlos Bachara, who is a professor of surgery at Loyola University School of Medicine, program director of Loyola Vascular Surgery Fellowship, and the co-director of the Loyola Center for Aortic Disease. This MVSS webinar is focused on recent technology for managing complex venous disease as presented by vascular surgeons. And we are joined today by four distinguished speakers with a variety of expertise in using these new technologies. Our first speaker, Dr. Hui T. Chen, is a vascular surgeon and assistant professor of surgery at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine in East Lansing, Michigan. She obtained her medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine and is a board certified vascular surgeon, having completed her vascular training at the University of Michigan. She then practiced for several years in Virginia before returning to Michigan at Henry Ford Jackson Hospital. And her interests include medical education and curriculum development. And as an attending vascular surgeon in McLaren Greater Lansing, she continues to dedicate her time both in and out of the OR to medical students and re resident teaching. So Dr. Chen will discuss current guidelines in venous disease. Thank you, Dr. Lin, for the warm introduction. Uh, thank you also, Dr. Bashara, the uh, Midwestern Vascular Society and Cook for the opportunity to speak on this topic. Um, let me go ahead and share screen then. So this topic um, is current guidelines of venous disease. Um, this is uh, just the facts, ma'am. No um, exciting images from the operating room, but I do see some that are coming up on, uh, on upcoming talks. I have no disclosures. So um, the focus of this particular set of guidelines is I'm gonna be talking about the SVS, AVF, and AVLS clinical practice guidelines for the management of varicose veins of the lower extremities. So as we all know, the um, previous guidelines came out in 2011 from the Society for Vascular Surgery and American Venus Forum uh, clinical practice guidelines. So um, now uh, since that uh, publication in 2011, there is now five to 10 year follow-up data from multiple prospective randomized controlled trials. And these were incorporated in the uh, updated guidelines. So, so far, what's been published as of 2022 is part one of the guidelines, and that is regarding duplex scanning and treatment of superficial truncal reflux. So I would expect that more parts are forthcoming um, and to keep an eye out for those. But right now, we just have part one, and that'll be the focus of uh, today's discussion. So there's multiple um, points of uh, uh, discussion for uh, the guidelines um, for part one, and I'll go through each one of them. There's five. So the first is the use of duplex um, ultrasound in um, the diagnostic capabilities in C2 to 6 disease in adults. The second is um, the surgical approach, high ligation and uh, surgical stripping versus um, endovenous ablation for great or small saphenous vein incompetence. The third is thermal versus non-thermal um, ablation techniques 
for these patients with greater small saphenous incompetence. The fourth is regarding perforating veins, um, whether to ablate uh, versus not ablate in these folks with C2 disease. And then finally, um, regarding treating the varicose tributaries uh, concomitant or staged after initial treatment with um, uh, of uh, greater small saphenous vein reflux. So to break down each one of these, again, the first one is regarding um, the diagnostic evaluation of venous incompetence with duplex ultrasound. So you can see the first bullet point here was the recommendation back in 2011. So the recommendation was for these patients with chronic venous disease, in addition to a um, history and physical, the duplex scanning is a complement um, to that part of the um, uh, patient history. And um, it basically says the, this, the test is safe and reliable. So in 2022, it's become a lot more specific. So it says that um, the societies recommend duplex scanning as the diagnostic test of choice to evaluate venous reflux. There are some additional points made in 2022, which I think are incredibly um, pointed and helpful. So the bolding is mine, but you can see that first bullet point where the recommendation is that duplex ultrasound be performed by an IAC or ACR accredited vascular laboratory uh, by a credentialed ultrasonographer. And also you can see bullet point two, which again, the bolding is mine, but the study should be interpreted by a physician trained in venous duplex ultrasound interpretation. There's also additional points made um, such as number three there, where um, the description is that transverse grayscale images should be obtained with and without transducer compression. So you can see that um, the language uh, with the new update is uh, far more specific. One more point made um, in the new guidelines is regarding how the um, study should be performed. And you can see it includes diameter measurements of the patient with the leg in dependent position um, and how the uh, diameter should be measured as well. So far more um, uh, specific description of how the study should be performed. So that's regarding duplex ultrasound. Um, number two was regarding surgical uh, versus ablation techniques. So high ligation and stripping versus any endovascular ablation technique for these patients uh, with greater small saphenous incompetence. So the first bullet point, 2011, um, <clears throat> the recommendation was um, endothermal ablation is recommended um, due to decreased uh, pain and morbidity over open surgery. So in 2022, again, the bolding is mine. The recommendation is um, to perform ligation stripping if the technology or expertise of ablation is not available. So that's a different way of phrasing it. It almost seems like you should really err towards performing ablation um, first, but they don't say it that way, but to recommend open treatment only if endovascular ablation is not available. Um, <clears throat> additionally, you can see um, the recommendation is endovenous ablation over high ligation and stripping of great saphenous vein, small saphenous vein because of less post-procedural pain, earlier return to regular activity. And also you can see the second bullet point also discusses quality of life and um, recurrence as well. So um, in those patients, um, laser ablation, radiofrequency ablation, or open surgery are all recommended over the um, ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. Uh, the third guideline is regarding thermal versus non-thermal ablation. So back in 2011, um, again, some of the data that we know now has not, had not come out yet. So the rec recommendation then was uh, thermal ablations, whether it be laser or radio frequency are safe and effective and the societies recommend them for treatment of saphenous incompetence. And um, again, referring back to open surgery, we recommend endothermous uh, venous ablation um, over open surgery. That was back in 2011. So in 2022, the recommendation is now both thermal and non-thermal ablation um, for great and small saphenous veins. 
and um, a suggestion of either thermal or non-thermal ablation for um, anterior or posterior accessory saphenous veins. Uh, for guideline four, this is regarding perforating veins. Um, back in 2011, the, the verbiage was, we recommend against selective treatment of incompetent perforating veins in patients with CEEP2 disease. Um, and suggest treatment of uh, these pathologic perforating veins with these specific parameters um, if they're involved with a healed or open uh, venous ulcer. So that's quite a bit different from what we see now in the um, 2022 update. So, so in these patients with CEEP2 disease, um, the recommendation is we recommend against treatment of incompetent perforating veins um, and concomitant ablation of the superficial trun truncal veins. Um, but in patients with recurrent symptoms after previous ablation, there is a suggestion of treatment of the perforating veins if it is the origin of these symptomatic um, varicose veins. So this doesn't have the same verbiage of there must be involvement of a active or healed ulcer. And then finally, guideline five is regarding whether to perform concomitant versus stage treatment of the varicose tributaries. In 2011, the recommendation was um, ambulatory, ambulatory phlebectomy for treatment of these veins um, performed either during or um, at, at a later stage. And the Specific description is if general um, anesthesia is involved, then to perform it concomitantly. Um, now in 2022, um, the recommendation is ablation of the refluxing venous trunk and concomitant phlebectomy um, or sclerotherapy of the veins for a great saphenous or a small saphenous vein. So um, quite a bit different from what we saw in 2011. Um, finally, for symptomatic reflux of the major superficial venous trunks, um, undergoing initial ablation alone. So if the, if the option is just to go at it alone first, then that these patients need to follow up, be followed up for at least three months to reassess whether or not there's any need for a staged uh, treatment of those varicosities. So in conclusion, the new guidelines uh, draw from 11 years of updated literature. Um, looking specifically, it looks like they drew from, um, I think eight or, eight or nine randomized control trials with five-year data and one with 10-year data. So there's much more specific language now in the uh, 2022 update. Um, as I mentioned before, this is only part one and it's only regarding basically superficial truncal reflux and um, duplex ultrasound for diagnostic evaluation. There are additional topics from 2011, which aren't touched upon at all in this part one. Um, additional imaging, lab evaluation, um, the way that the outcomes are assessed and also pelvic varicose veins. Additionally, um, there's now input from the um, American Vein and Lymphatic Society. So I would expect that there would be um, some guidelines specifically detailing lymphatics as well for the uh, additional parts to be to be published. So looking forward to seeing what those entail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Chen. So next, um, we're going to have my partner, Dr. Salt. Um, thought he's, um, you know, uh, did his, uh, he actually went to med school at Ohio State and East Virginia for general surgery, and then eventually uh, made his way to Chicago for uh, Northwestern for his fellowship, and he joined us, and he's an assistant professor um, at Loyola and associate program director and the director of the complex aortic program at Heinz VA. So he's going to be talking to us about venous stenting for iliofemoral deep venous thrombosis. Dr. Salt. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bachar and Dr. Lin. I appreciate the uh, MVSS, the New Horizons webinar series, uh, and Cook for the opportunity to uh, talk this evening. Uh, so here are my disclosures, uh, but more importantly, I do have to disclose that it was only a couple of months ago that uh, Dr. Milner had me debate that stenting the left iliac vein is ridiculous uh, against my opponent, the Honorable uh, 
Dr. Muck in Cincinnati. However, he was too scared of me, so he had his fellow do it uh, because he didn't want to join the debate. So as we know, post-thrombotic syndrome follows acute DVT. Uh, you get uh, outflow obstruction, asymptomatic uh, to phlegmasia, and so that sort of led to trying to figure out what to do with these patients. Ultimately, long-term, you get the post-thrombotic syndrome. It's edema, pain, heaviness, hyperpigmentation, uh, lipo, uh, lipodermis glomerular, lipodermatous sclerosis, ulceration, um, but you can't diagnose that unless it's six months out after it's acute DVT because there's a lot of similar overlap on symptoms. It occurs in about two, one of every two to three, so half to a third of patients will get um, post-thrombotic syndrome after acute iliofemoral DVT, and a majority of the developed symptoms within two years of uh, diagnosis of their acute DVT. Really, it kind of treatment has always hinged on this open vein hypothesis that if you alleviate the obstruction, um, alleviation of the obstruction will prevent impaired venous return, valvular damage, and reflux. So the sooner that you can get there, uh, the less likely you're going to get those problems that lead to post-thrombotic syndrome and really push for some open versus endo options. So in, in reality, with all of that, we had the Kevin, uh, or Kevin trial, which started in, was published in 2011. It was looking at open venous thrombectomy versus catheter-directed alteplase. And what they suggested was that there was an overall decrease in post-thrombotic syndrome of about 28%. However, in this cohort, only 34% were iliofemoral DVTs, and they only stented 15 or 17%, which was 15 patients in the whole group. Um, this sort of pushed to the biggest trial where we talk about DVT management and sort of was the ATTRACT trial, which was pharmacomechanical thrombectomy versus anticoagulation. Uh, and sort of the overall, what they found was there was no difference in post-thrombotic syndrome at 24 months, uh, but they did de see a decrease when they did some subset analysis of PTS in the obstructive iliofemoral DVT uh, group. However, again, there was a very low rate of stenting in this patient population with only 28% of patients getting stents. More recently, the CAVA, or the CAVA trial uh, used acoustic, acoustic pulse uh, thrombolysis versus anticoagulation. Again, just like a tract, they found no difference in post-thrombotic syndrome at 12 months, uh, but their stent rate went up, but it still was only about 45%. Again, not with a lot of subgroup analysis to really tell us what to do in this iliofemoral area. And really, a tract is the big one that's kind of pushed most of us to be more aggressive in acute DVTs to at least try to open it up. But the question is what to do about stenting. So again, really low stent rates in all three of these big trials, uh, but they all had flawed methodology. They weren't great at randomizing. They didn't have great, uh, you know, initially we didn't have great descriptors. We had the CEP classification, but the Velada scores kind of come out. So as the vascular uh, comorbidity or uh, comorb the, vasc the VCSS uh, score has also come out and that's allowed us to evaluate our literature a little bit better and have more uniform uh, conversation about what the outcomes are. And realistically, we had pretty low rates of stenting, and the question is why. So iliac vein stents, uh, really for the longest time, it was just the Boston Scientific Wall stent. It wasn't a des uh, designated venous stent, um, but since about you know a few years ago, we've started actually having dedicated stents. We had the Bard Venovo stent, the Cook Venus stent, and the Medtronic Abre are all the ones that are certain are currently on the market. There was a, a Boston Scientific Vici stent that was on the market, but it has been recalled and they have, are, have abandoned that stent. Um, and it comes back to kind of going back to that same 2011 uh, guidelines from the SVS and the American Venus Forums. They recommended stenting of the illofemoral lesions in DVT with 1C evidence. So it's kind of interesting that all of those studies that sort of were done uh, especially afterwards, never really looked at that and didn't really didn't address what was going on with iliofemoral lesions and DVT. So my approach, uh, whether it's acute or chronic, is to address this with the patient being in the supine position. Uh, so I know a lot of people will do prone positioning for acute DVTs when they're going to do the mechanical thrombolysis or chemical or pharmacomechanical thrombolysis, uh, but I tend to access the popliteal or the uh, posterior tibial vein in a supine position because I think it just gives me more options as I go down the road. Uh, you want to leave access long enough to provide inflow. Um, chronic, I usually stay higher in the thigh, but not always in the common femoral vein. I'll make go down to the femoral vein. You want to cross the lesion. I tend to put a, a wire up into the IJ for stability, depending on what I need to do to use my IVIS, uh, whether I need to balloon, stent, uh, thrombectomy, or whatever is whatever adjunct procedures. Uh, to give me more stability and kind of give me a better uh, platform for doing a lot of my interventions. 
IVIS uh, is really important in all of these cases when you're trying to address this. Uh, single view angiography we know has about a 45% sensitivity, so it's really hard to just take a picture uh, in a 2D image and determine whether there's stenosis. I think we I think these cases really need IVIS. And most of the literature was designed with the idea that there needs to be a greater than 50% degree area reduction uh, to warrant what we would call a significant stenosis, which is obviously lower than what we use in the arterial literature. Uh, but through all of the research that I've kind of did trying to find out where that came from, there's no clear cut answer. I think that number was sort of picked arbitrarily so we could have a, a cut point um, and sort of started on the arterial side. But there's there's not a clear definition as to why 50% is what was used in all of these trials. So kind of giving you a case to sort of how I approach these things. I got a 57-year-old female, history of chronic DVT in the left external iliac vein, left lower extremity swelling, non-healing uh, anterior shin wound, has tried compression, had a history of an IVC filter, which was removed three years prior, and her duplex showed chronic non-occlusive thrombus in the external iliac vein. Uh, so as you can see here, here's I, we've accessed the lesion from below. Uh, you can see there's a lot of collateral. So you know there's this venous hypertension that's sort of preventing your outflow. Uh, and that's why it's trying to go through the collateral flow. Here we have our IVIS of both the right and the left leg. Um, and as you can see, coming down on the one on the right, everything's sort of open. There's a little bit of compression after there, after the bifurcation, but on the left side, there's quite a bit of compression right there past the bifurcation, uh, which is really leading to this hypertension and ultimately her uh, wound on the other side. So I was able to cross the lesion. You can see on the image on the left, that's our my IVIS catheter. I use that a lot for sizing, uh, both the IVC, my iliacs, and to get length measurements. Uh, we then, I did a kissing uh, iliac vein stents here uh, in the double barrel technique, um, which there is not a great answer as to whether you should do that or not, but based on where the lesion was for me, that lesion was right at the iliac confluence, so I felt that it was necessary to go higher, given that they were thrombotic, I didn't want to increase the risk of thrombotic complications on the other side. The literature is not great on that answer. When you look at it, the ranges from about 3 to 10% of contralateral leg uh, um, thrombotic events after unilateral iliac vein stenting into the IVC. However, a lot of it is underreported. So it's not entirely clear as to what the right answer is. And it's certainly debated as to whether you should do unilateral or bilateral stenting when you have very close to the confluence uh, iliac vein lesions. Here I extended on the other side, and then this is the completion venography showing much better flow. You don't see the you don't see that um, the flow in on this completion through the uh, through a lot of those collaterals or the internal uh, iliac vein. At six months, uh, she had resolution of the wound uh, and stents were patent by duplex. Um, I you can certainly ask about what my uh, routine is after this, but I know we're going to do a talk on what the current management is of uh, treatment afterwards. Realistically, um, it's important to realize that, you know, as, even though that these stents are great and you do get better pictures and you get better patency and you get better res resolution of symptoms, uh, the reality was in 2007, uh, we had about a 67 primary or 67 percent primary patency rate with a 93 uh, percent secondary patency rate. So while the primary pa primary patency rates aren't great. Um, they do get better with time or with, with assistance, and it's actually a pretty low morbid procedure to keep open. And that's important to realize because obviously a lot of these patients that we're talking about putting these in, especially in acute DVTs, are relatively young patients. And so it's kind of interesting that this, you know, we don't have a ton of great data to multiple years out, especially with these dedicated venous stents. So it's something we have to keep a close eye on because we don't want to be doing something that's going to create a problem. Sort of moving more to real world data that we have now in 2020, there was a Swiss venous stent registry. They had 379 patients. Of those patients, uh, they looked, or that's a registry of all patients, all comers, whether that's for non invasive lesions or not, or nibble lesions, so non obstructive iliac vein um, lesions, or for DVTs and post thrombotic. It was very nice that they separated this out so we can kind of really get a better breakdown. A lot of the literature shows that stenting for post-thrombotic syndrome, the, sort of the, 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 the cat's out of the bag at that point. And while they do get some better resolution of symptoms, they tend to have lower patency rates. And you can see that both in primary and secondary patency out to three years. What's better is if you go after the acute DVTs, that's the blue line underneath, you'll see that you have an 80% three-year patency, primary patency rate, but a 95 to almost 96% secondary patency rate. So if you can get in there early, you can really keep these stents open and you have better outcomes than waiting for the patient to develop post-thrombotic syndrome and sort of uh, attacking it at that point. 
but you have to be leery. 3% of patients will have migration. It's something we have to be thoughtful of. It's a devastating conse conf or, uh, consequence or a complication to this procedure. And obviously it costs and bias Boston Scientific an entire uh, line of stents that is no longer on the market. We don't want to end up like the IVC filters and walking around the hospital late night having uh, lots of different um, advertisements for have you had an iliac, or an iliac vein stent, please call us. We were going to do our, uh, our, our class action lawsuits and we don't want to be there. So we have to be very thoughtful. And I think patient selection is the most important part of this. So in conclusion, uh, keep in mind that in acute DVTs, a third to a half of those patients with venous outflow obstruction are will get post-thrombotic syndrome. While reintervention rates are high, no matter what these are placed for outside of the nibble lesions, there is increased patency and improved symptom relief with its associated stenting. And really, in my opinion, IVIS should be used in all of these to evaluate the iliac vein for sizing, determine if there's associated compression before you place a stent. Again, I'd like to thank the New Horizons uh, webinar committee, the MVSS, and uh, Drs. Bachar and Dr. Lynn for letting me speak this evening. Well, that was an extensive review on the venous stenting for illofemoral DVT. So moving on, our next speaker is Dr. Nader Tahari, who is a vascular surgery attending at Northwest Community Healthcare. And he's originally from Michigan. Um, Nader, uh, he, Dr. Tahari is a community-based vascular surgeon out of Arlington, Illinois. He completed his general surgery residency at Southern Illinois University in Springfield and went on to fellowship at Loyola University in Maywood. His current practice is broad-based vascular surgery with an emphasis on venous and cerebrovascular disease. And he's very grateful for all the wise toolage that he has received and continue to receive from Dr. Bachara. <laughs> Dr. Tarani will present an IVC filter placement and retrieval tips and tricks. Take it away. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to speak. Uh, it's good to see you, Drs. Uh, Bashar and Solt. I trained under both of them. I have no disclosures. In terms of the outline of my talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background just because I like to look at the history and see where the technology came from. I'll talk a little bit about the indications for placement because I think this is really the crux of IBC filters, knowing when is appropriate to place them. Um, some considerations in terms of anatomics, uh, variability, and things to consider when you're placing them. Then moving on to filter removal, standard removal, some advanced endovascular techniques, and then briefly just touch on open surgery. So in terms of background, vena cava interruption has been performed as early as 1700s to 1800s uh, via open technique. The thought and development towards uh, this uh, procedure and technique really has been the idea that we're trapping emboli while maintaining adequate blood flow. Understandably, a lot of the earlier efforts failed, resulting in venous thrombosis. The first uh, umbrella design filter uh, was placed in 1967. Uh, it was placed transvenously with the new onset of uh, uh, transvascular alt, uh, techniques. The Greenfield filter, the original stainless steel Greenfield filter came out in 1973. More recent developments have uh, really been focused on retrievable filters and uh, removing them with the new data that's been out. Um, in terms of indications for placement, there are a lot of indications and you can really break it down into the uh, evidence-based uh, guidelines and then the expanded indications. Uh, looking at the evidence-based guidelines, uh, the strongest data supports the uh, documented uh, venous thromboembolism and patients who have a contraindication to anticoagulation or have had a complication of anticoagulation, patients who have had pulmonary embolism despite therapeutic anticoagulation, and venous thromboembolism with the inability to achieve therapeutic anticoagulation. The expanded indications, there's a huge list of them. I really kind of broke it down into patients, you know, poor compliance with anticoagulation, uh, uh, venous thromboembolism with limited reserve, patients who already have underlying cardiopulmonary disease, and then uh, venous thromboembolism in high-risk patients. These are the trauma patients, cancer patients, um, uh, post-op patients. Understanding that these expanded indications have uh, less data supporting it. In terms of breaking it down, the way I like to think about it, you know, when you look at these long lists of expanded indications, for me, the strongest data supports um, uh, the presence of a, a DVT or PE and either a contraindication to anticoagulation, complication, or failure of anticoagulation. And this is supported um, uh, really by the CHESS Physician Guidelines in 2016, uh, as well as the Society of Interventional Radiology Guidelines in 2020, uh, which was also done uh, with the support of the Society for Vascular Surgery. 
taking this all away, um, the thing, what I like to remember is that if a patient has uh, a venous thromboembolism or is at risk, but they can tolerate anticoagulation, there really isn't a very strong indication for filter placement. In addition, it should not be primary prophylaxis in patients without venous thromboembolism. Obviously, this is different in the real world. You know, a lot of uh, surgeons ask for IVC filter placements for various procedures, wanting to keep them off anticoagulation. Um, all I can say is you just, you know, you have to have a close discussion with the operating team and uh, uh, have a timeline for removal of these filters when you do place them. In terms of placement considerations, uh, looking at the anatomy of the IVC, uh, break it down to four segments, infrarenal, renal, suprarenal, and hepatic. Uh, some landmarks to remember, uh, origin of the IVC around the L4, L5 level. Uh, renal veins um, come off around L1, L2, with the right renal vein usually being a little bit lower. Uh, there are some anatomic variations to be aware of. Uh, renal vein anomaly, circumaortic, or multiple renal veins, understanding that not only are you, generally you want to land the filter below it, but um, in situations where you have multiple renal veins entering very close, this can lead to a, a big ostium, which you may inadvertently land a leg into and could result in tilt if you're not aware. Um, IVC transposition and duplication, very rare, but once again, this changes uh, where you're going to put the filter, either place it suprarenal or place one into uh, the each duplicated infrarenal segment. And then IVC agenesis, which is also very rare and generally is thought to be a contraindication for filter placement. Uh, however, uh, placement in very dilated ascus veins has been described. Some placement tricks, um, any kind of, a lot of these patients um, uh, come with imaging ahead of time. It's important to review this, uh, any CTs, uh, duplexes to identify anatomic variants. I routinely get a, uh, vena, a lower extremity duplex to assess for axis site thrombosis. Um, during the procedure, I perform an intraoperative venogram to look for IVC thrombus. Uh, I then uh, perform a measurement of the IVC through the venogram. Um, most of the filters generally have a maximum diameter around 28 to 32 millimeters. The Cook Select uh, dilator that comes with the filter actually has two markers on it that are 30 millimeters apart, so you can use it to, to gauge the diameter of the vena cava. Um, and then uh, marker, you can also use a marker catheter to uh, measure it. In terms of uh, during the procedure, after that, I use the venogram to identify the renal and common iliac veins. Um, this is either done through venography. Sometimes it's not very easy to see. Uh, so you can either use bony landmarks and correlate it to preoperative imaging, or you can use IVIS. In terms of landing it, the tip of the filter usually lies below the renal, renal vein, which is on the right. Uh, suprarenal placement uh, can be done if there's extensive thrombus or there's an anatomic variation. Um, I'm not going to talk about this too much. You can perform transabdominal uh, ultrasound guidance for patients who can't come down to the uh, uh, cath lab, um, patients who are too sick. Um, you can use the ultrasound to uh, get your landmarkers and deploy the filter. Um, generally, you want at least a pre before you bring all your supplies up, get a pre-procedural ultrasound just to make sure you can actually see what you need to see. Um, and then finally, IVIS guidance to place this. Uh, this can be done at the bedside with portable with the portable imaging tower. Um, if you have it, um, it's nice. You can measure the IVC uh, diameter. And then if you're having difficulty visualizing the confluence of the iliac veins, you can place a, a good trick as a contralateral wire on the other side and seeing where it passes uh, across can identify the uh, confluence of the iliac veins. Uh, generally, I prefer, you know I use the IVIS for in a, in a pullback technique to kind of uh, get my landmarks and get my bearings starting at the right atrium, uh, pulling down to identify the hepatic veins, the renal veins, and then the uh, and then getting a measurement of the infrarenal IVC. So filter removal, um, filter removal really begins at the time of placement. Uh, when you're putting these, you should have an idea of when you're going to uh, take it out and stick to that plan. Uh, you should remove them when the risk of uh, pulmonary embolism is low and when anticoagulation can safely be resumed. Uh, when these patients show up in clinic or when you're consult and there's no uh, imaging, when there's, you have no idea what type it was or when it was placed, I do obtain uh, preoperative imaging just to, to show me what type it is because sometimes you'll be surprised and that can definitely change the approach. In terms of technique, um, for a standard removal, I, I generally uh, come from the jugular access. I take a, uh, a pre-removal essential uh, venogram to ensure there's no IVC thrombus. Um, then using the standard uh, snare, I get across the hook and then sheath it fairly straightforward. Um, in terms of some advanced techniques, 
Um, generally, if I'm expecting it to be a complex retrieval, if it's been in for a long time or if there's a significant amount of tilt, um, I will start with a large sheath, uh, 14 or 16 French um, sheath, just so, so I have uh, some options. In terms of my workflow, generally I start with telescoping, I'll then move on to loop snare, endobronchial forceps, and then finally a few different fiber and disruption techniques. And that's just kind of how I escalate these um, in, my, in my mind. Um, starting off with the loop snare or the hangman technique, um, I'll pass a, a omni flush or a curved catheter past the filter, um, then get an 035 glide wire and then snare it. Once again, having a large sheath helps with this. I'll then uh, pull up on the wire and make sure it's seated underneath the body of the filter. This is very important. Um, this picture on the right um, is not what you're shooting for. You do not want it just underneath one, of the, one or two of the tines. This can lead to further tilt and can even fracture the filter. Um, next, um, I move on to uh, uh, endobronchial forceps. Um, I'll, uh, you can do a little bit of uh, dissection with it, once again, uh, taking care to grab the main body of the filter and uh, try to uh, pull it into the, the sheath. And then there are various uh, fibrin disruption techniques. Um, I usually resort to uh, the balloon. Uh, if you get a wire down and inflate a balloon, um, this can disrupt some of the fibrin and sometimes can reduce the tilt and straighten your uh, filter, make it easier to retrieve. Uh, there is a double snare technique. I haven't personally done this, um, but basically you come from above and, above and below and try to uh, loop it. You can loop it from below. That can help collapse it and also straighten it, um, facilitating snaring the hook from above um, and uh, pulling it from in from above. In terms of, uh, uh, finally, uh, fiber and disruption techniques, there, you can use a laser sheet that they use for um, lead extraction. I, I don't have any, from, I've never done this before, um, but for uh, filters that are really embedded, uh, once you get into sheath, you can use it to essentially cut the fiber and sheath and retrieve the filter. So um, there's a couple of videos. This was actually an Optease. Um, you can see on the right, this is a good view of me using everything, basically. Um, I, I actually did this with Dr. Bashar as a fellow, um, use, using uh, endobronchial forceps and a balloon to disrupt the fibrin and pulling it. And then on the left, this is a, I'm using the telescope technique, you know, basically uh, with a large sheath, trying to pass a smaller sheath within to try to disrupt the fibrin and pull it and pull the uh, uh, filter into the larger sheath. One thing I just want to mention, just kind of a, a unique case. I've had, a, I've done a couple of these um, as an attending. Um, generally, thrombose filters um, were left in place. Um, but one thing that to to consider if you're if a patient is uh, has a thrombosis the filter has ex has extensive DVT, iliofemoral DVT, and is symptomatic, you can retrieve these um, using a new protrieve sheath out of Inari for protection. Um, for PE, this was a case I did uh, fairly recently. A patient. Um, uh, had extensive IVC and uh, iliac vein uh, thrombosis with extensive scrotal and bilateral leg swelling. Um, I was able to uh, basically deploy the uh, protrieve sheath. You can see the protection cone up above. Um, use the uh, flow retriever to kind of debulk around the tip of the filter and then uh, ultimately retrieve it. Finally, just a couple points about open removal. Generally, this is reserved if endovascular techniques are unsuccessful and the patient is symptomatic. It's very important to, to weigh the risks of just leaving in the filter versus open surgery this is, as this is a rather large operation. Um, exposure to IVC, I won't go too much in detail, but it's a right medial visceral rotation, uh, cochlear maneuver to facilitate more exposure. Um, just some things to keep in mind. Watch out for the lumbar veins. If you can um, ligate the ones where you know that you'll be doing your venotomy, that can definitely help. The hooks, once you have proximal disc control and you've opened up the vein, um, the hooks can still be challenging. You know, you think it's open surgery, it'll just come out, but they can be very difficult to get out. You have to kind of unhook them. And sometimes you have to kind of take them apart piece by piece, um, have pliers and wire cutters ready. Thank you. All right, that was a nice, nice talk, Dr. Tarani. Thank you. So, uh, last but not least, um, we have Dr. Uh, Jody Gerdes. Uh, she's a vascular surgeon at Alina Health Minneapolis a Heart Institute uh, in Saint Paul, Minneapolis. Uh, she completed her fellowship uh, training at LSU, um, and then she was an assistant professor of clinical surgery at LSU in New Orleans. Uh, then she moved on private practice uh, in Tennessee, and then now she's back in, uh, or now she's at her current position with Alina Health. Um, Dr. Gerdes will present uh, best medical measurement after venous stenting.
Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking about medical management after venous stenting. I think best uh, should probably be put in parentheses for this talk, but we'll do our best. I have no disclosures for this talk. So why is this topic important? Um, well, coming next month in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, there's an abstract that will be published regarding the usage trends of venous stents in the United States over a seven year period of time. So without getting into too many details about the abstract, um, basically in 2019, the FDA approved two venous stents and a couple of years later recalled both of those stents. So this abstract and this data in this abstract is looking kind of through this period of time and the usage of venous stents over again, the seven year period. So if you look at the kind of overall numbers um, through this period, it, it appears at first glance that venous stent usage is going down. But if you look at stents use per day, it's actually significantly increasing. So it's an important topic. Um, as mentioned previously, um, these can be challenging cases and can have complications such as instant restenosis or stent thrombosis after the procedure. And obviously our number one goal is to provide long-term symptom relief for our patients. So where are we at currently? Uh, in 2022, the European Society for Vascular Surgery published their guidelines regarding uh, chronic venous disease and I highlighted in red at the bottom that they uh, stated that post-procedural anticoagulation and antiplatelet treatment after iliac vein stenting remains a matter of debate. So we're gonna kind of walk through that debate uh, tonight. Current practice uh, following venous stenting as far as anticoagulation and antiplatelet can include any one of these uh, regimens. And obviously I made this slide dramatic for a reason. So it leaves a lot of unanswered questions regarding medical management, whether or not the patient should be anticoagulated, how long they should be anticoagulated, which is the best medication, and is there a role for antiplatelet therapy? So here's kind of an overview of the talk tonight. We're gonna to start with a review article and then go through an article um, with these different patient populations to try to figure out um, if there is best medical management following venous stenting in each different cohort of patients. So the review article um, is from Northwestern University published in 2020. This is from the Department of Radiology titled Antithrombotic Therapy After Venous Stent Placement. So they noted that our current practice uh, regarding medical management after venous stenting is largely based off of our experience with arterial stents, and that may not be correct. They also noted in their review that there's a large variation in study designs, outcomes, uh, data, and the time period after which these patients are followed. So here's the studies that were in their review. Um, Again, just kind of looking at this chart briefly, you'll see that there's surveys, there's larger uh, meta-analyses, there's retrospective reviews, there's case series. Again, the patient populations are varied. And kind of looking over at this uh, conclusions column, you'll see a lot of variations in uh, recommendations, um, different medications that are used, different time periods. So they attempted to come up with some conclusions based on their review. So they concluded that postoperative anticoagulation following venous stenting is likely needed, but the time frame over which these patients are anticoagulated remains a matter of debate. They suggested that three to 12 months, which is still a large range, um, might be sufficient unless there's additional risk factors in these patients or other indications for anticoagulation. These authors uh, concluded that DOAX may be the preferred agent the addition of antiplatelet therapy may reduce instant stenosis. The etiology of the disease can play a role in your postoperative management, and thrombophilia in the setting of venous stenting is not well studied. So at the end of their review, they did suggest this particular algorithm for anticoagulation following venous stenting. 
they kind of broke the patients down into those with thrombotic etiology versus non-thrombotic etiology. They again preferred DOAX for a period of six to 12 months with an antiplatelet agent. And then following that six to 12 months, continuing with an antiplatelet agent indefinitely, or if there were other risk factors or a history of multiple DVTs, they suggested consulting hematology and considering lifelong anticoagulation along with an antiplatelet agent. So moving on to our first uh, cohort of patients, those with non-thrombotic venous lesions or NIVLs. This is an article published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venous and Lymphatic Disorders from May of last year, looking at immediate post-procedure anticoagulation with factor 10A inhibitors. And they specifically looked at stent patency. So this is a retrospective review covering a two-year period of time looking at iliac vein stents placed for symptomatic non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions. So in practice, a patient with May Thurner who's symptomatic but has not had a history of DVT related to the May Thurner anatomy. They broke their patients down into two groups, those that received anticoagulation with either rivaroxaban or apixaban for a minimum of 90 days. That was then continued at the discretion of the physician particularly in those patients if thrombus was noted within the stent or at the insertion site. The second group were those patients that did not receive any postoperative anticoagulation. Their primary outcome was stent patency, which was analyzed by ultrasound at these time intervals. So antiplatelet therapy could be continued uh, in these patients if they were on it preoperatively or if it was added postoperatively, then those patients were included in the non-anticoagulation group. So they found that uh, for primary patency, which is again their primary outcome, they did not note a difference in primary patency between those patients that were anticoagulated versus those that were not anticoagulated. So their conclusions were that patients with Non-thrombotic iliac vein lesions should not routinely receive anticoagulation following venous stent placement. Anticoagulation could be started for those patients that uh, demonstrated on their follow-up ultrasounds uh, thrombosis at the insertion site or layering within the stent itself. Pregnant women should receive low molecular weight heparin if they have iliac stents, and any patient with a hypercoagulable disorder should be anticoagulated as well. So moving on to the next group, those with an acute iliofemoral DVT. This is an article published in the JVS uh, in September of last year, looking at risk factors and classification of re-intervention following these stents. So also a retrospective review covering a four-year period of time, including patients that had symptomatic acute or subacute iliofemoral DVTs for less than 28 days uh, duration. These patients underwent thrombolysis followed by iliac vein stenting. They were followed for a minimum of 12 months and re-interventions were performed on these patients if they had a greater than 50% stenosis within the stent, if they felt that the stent was threatened, if there was a correctable anatomic issue, a stent occlusion or a mechanical problem such as stent fracture or compression. Their regimen for medication management following the procedure was to start the patient on a therapeutic low molecular weight heparin within an hour of the procedure. This was then continued for at least two weeks after which the patient was uh, surveyed with ultrasound and then transitioned to an oral anticoagulant. So again, one of the aims of this study was to develop a classification system um, regarding reintervention. So they kind of broke it down into four categories, um, one being hematologic. And they found that a lot of the patients re requiring reintervention um, had a dose-related hematologic issue, and that was usually non-compliance with this regimen of uh, Lovenox then transitioning to an oral anticoagulant. So non-compliance with the anticoagulation regimen was found to be statistically significant and leading to more reinterventions in these patients. So again, hematologic issues were identified in a third of these patients that needed reintervention, and the vast majority of those were dose-related 
and the vast majority of those were not in compliance with the regimen. So they suggested a multidisciplinary approach to post-procedure anticoagulation, again, using hematology if needed, considering any underlying thrombophilia, and when the patients were transitioned to an oral agent, consider a DOAC uh, just for ease of use and compliance. And finally, the last group of patients are the most complex, those um, that have undergone iliac stenting for venous outflow occlusion. This study looked at early thrombosis uh, regarding the disease severity and type of anticoagulation that was used. This was also published in the JBS in 2021. Also a retrospective review covering a 10 year period of time, looking at patients that underwent venous stenting for chronic obstruction. This could have been in the common femoral distribution, the iliac veins or the IVC. Their primary outcome was stent thrombosis or reocclusion within three months of implantation. So this study was uh, interesting. It was two hospitals and 11 different interventionalists um, their post-procedure regimen varied. Um, about half of the patients received antiplatelets following the procedure. Greater than 95% were anticoagulated, and the vast majority of those were anticoagulated with a low molecular weight heparin. That was either, either used as a bridge to warfarin or uh, continued for two to four weeks before transitioning to an oral agent. About 37% of these patients were started on a factor 10A inhibitor and a smaller percentage uh, were just continued on warfarin uh, and those patients were on a long-term warfarin regimen and that was not held for the procedure itself. So they identified several factors uh, related to early stent thrombosis that reached statistical significance. Um, I've started the important ones regarding this talk, but the presence of a hypercoagulable state led to more stent thrombosis the type of anticoagulation and specifically utilizing uh, low molecular weight heparin for greater than 10 days following the procedure led to fewer uh, stent thromboses. So here's uh, a graph comparing uh, the three agents, either factor 10A inhibitor, low molecular weight heparin used for greater than 10 days or warfarin, looking at the primary patency rates over the two years following uh, stent placement. And the orange line is the low molecular weight heparin, which uh, performed better. So their discussion in this article was uh, quite interesting. They postulated why the low molecular weight heparin may be better than factor 10A inhibitors. And they suggested that the factor 10A inhibitors had a more limited effect on the coagulation pathway and the anti-inflammatory effects of low molecular weight heparin is beneficial. So why was low molecular weight heparin used for greater than 10 days beneficial? They felt that this was a more consistent uh, anticoagulant effect um, versus transitioning earlier to an oral anticoagulant. Uh, obviously this can be a difficult regimen for patients to comply with. So it's something that you need to discuss with your patients preoperatively and they have to be willing to um, participate in this regimen. They really felt that that initial period following recanalization of a chronically occluded lesion followed by stenting, when that stent is exposed and the new intima is forming may require a more intense regimen of anticoagulation versus a, a long-term regimen. So at the end of their review, they did recommend low molecular weight heparin at therapeutic doses for three to four weeks before transitioning to an oral anticoagulant. So to go back to the overview, to kind of just recap all the data we just talked about, the, the review article from Northwestern uh, Radiology suggested utilizing a DOAC with an antiplatelet for at least six months and then transitioning to an antiplatelet indefinitely for the patients with a non-thrombotic iliac vein lesion, uh, anticoagulation uh, prophylaxis is not recommended. For those patients with an acute iliofemoral DVT, utilizing low molecular weight heparin for at least a two week period before transitioning to oral anticoagulation is recommended. And then finally, the most complex patients with venous outflow obstruction, the recommendation would be to utilize a low molecular weight heparin at therapeutic doses for three to four weeks 
before transitioning uh, to an oral anticoagulant. So again, I don't know that I can demonstrate or define for you the best medical management, but I think this slide uh, kind of sums up as patients become more complex, uh, perhaps using a low molecular weight heparin initially and then transitioning to an oral anticoagulant seems to be the trend in the literature. So did we answer any of our questions? Um, maybe regarding anticoagulation or not. I think again, that overview slide kind of lays it out. How long to anticoagulate these patients uh, is a question that needs to be studied further. Which anticoagulation to use? Again, that low molecular weight heparin seems to be important in that early period, uh, but the oral anticoagulation used after that is debatable. And is there a role for antiplatelet therapy? Um, in next month's uh, JVS, Venous and Lymphatic Disorders, uh, this abstract will be published regarding uh, the use of early antiplatelet therapy following deep venous stenting and interventions. So for the sake of time, we won't go into a lot of these details, uh, but this uh, is, again, a retrospective review. They kind of grouped the patients together, looking at patients with uh, less complex disease and those post-thrombotic more complex patients. Their primary outcome was one year primary patency. Their uh, regimens were uh, somewhat varied as well, but their overall primary patency was uh, at 90%, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, they found that at one year primary patency was improved in those patients that had received uh, antiplatelet therapy, but it suggested that that antiplatelet effect may not uh, really go beyond one month. So they concluded that antiplatelet therapy at discharge uh, protected against the need for re-intervening on these stents. Um, surprisingly, um, obviously this is just an abstract, but it did mention smoking status, uh, which is other than showing up in a table of patient variables, this was the first uh, reference I really found to smoking status, um, which I thought was interesting and, and also a variable that needs to be studied. So there is hope for maybe more definitive uh, recommendations. These are two studies that are ongoing currently and set to be completed in the next uh, one to two years. And obviously as new venous devices hit the market, uh, more investigation will be needed. And with that, um, I'll say thank you again to the society and the moderators for having me this evening. Oh, that was fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Gerdes. I actually uh, recently uh, was in the, doing a course with Dr. Desai and and he mentioned the low molecular weight. So I'm glad you brought it up because uh, I think I'm going to start doing that in my practice. I, I honestly haven't, despite the literature, I haven't been doing it myself, but that makes sense. But uh, real quick, Dr. Curtis, if someone comes in with occluded stent and they've been on NOAC, do you automatically switch them? Let's say they're on Eliquis. Do you switch them to something else or do you think it's they're non-compliant? I mean, how do you evaluate non-compliance in some of these cases? I'm just interested in your thoughts on this. Yeah, I think a, a really good history um, from the patient and sometimes you need the family to help you with that to kind of fill in the details. Um, if you want to get uh, really tricky, you can call the pharmacy to see if they've actually filled their prescription um, to really try to nail down if this is a, a failure of their medication or not. Yeah. So I think I answered Dr. Arbit's question about, uh, I know the insurance asked for 5.5. Uh, I must add that article I sent, it's an old article, I think published in either late, early 2000s, early 19 something. But, uh, and also Dr. Mark was talking about a, a size tent. I think uh, maybe he's referring to the paper from Mississippi that I think they usually use 12 to 14, if I remember well, stents or nothing under 10. But I think what he's trying to emphasize the importance of sizing because you don't want these stents to embolize. And that's why Dr. Solwell mentioning the size with IVUS, which is, I think is crucial. But I'm gonna ask Dr. Sort and everyone else, um, how, um, um, are you, do you have problem taking the stent uh, across the profunda down the comofemoral vein? What, what's, your, what's your technique for that? Or should we doing more endophlebectomies uh, and patches? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I really try not to cross the inguinal ligament if at all possible. I mean, obviously it's all, especially in acute DVT, it's all about inflow. And so I think that's where the multitude of devices that we have now to really improve that inflow, whether that's mechanical, pharma mechanical, 
Um, even if you need to sort of leave a lytic catheter behind to get that inflow, if you don't have inflow from the leg, it's not going to work. And really the literature is pretty clear that, um, and even the, you know, our, our guidelines say don't put peripheral stent. So the, as soon as you kind of cross the ligament, that's when stent fractures, higher rates of stenosis, higher rates of occlusion all occur. So I think really trying to land short of that, if at all possible is, is kind of the goal. Um, but I agree. I mean, going longer, like, like I said, in my response, it's, you know, longer lengths are better. You need to anchor it. We don't want to have these things embolized because that's going to be a major, major problem if we do. And we're going to, we don't want to end up, like I said, we don't want to be down the IVC route of everybody getting sued for putting an IVC filter in. Yeah, I agree with, uh, the type of stent does matter. I think in my opinion, the ones that I've had fracture with the venoble stents, um, uh, and the, the, the wall stents and the Opry stents, I have crossed ingual ligaments without problems. So, and I usually just, if it, do, if they do fracture, I just basically go in and, and reinforce it with another stent. So that has not been an issue. Um, but I'm more about migration too, because now I'm starting to put stents for nutcrackers, you know, the left renal vein compression, you know, in select patients, I think it works. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm very, very cautious that it's going to embolize. So you really have to size it properly and, and go big and go long is usually my model for these. Yeah. I'm try trying to be mindful of the time, but a few more, maybe two more questions. Can Dr. Chen, so what's your uh, approach for the current varicose vein? Are you all high ligation? Uh, do you do high ligation or do you go after an another endovenous uh, attempt? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I personally try to avoid the high ligation and stripping if I can. I think the current guidelines kind of suggest that as well, which is that the morbidity um, and pain associated with it kind of outweighs the benefit there. Um, so I usually try to rescan and see if there's um, another uh, truncal vein that's refluxing and now contributing to the recurrence that wasn't appreciated before. And so with that type of recurrence picture, I try to go after that truncal vein. Um, I do want to also add to the question that was asked earlier about the um, insurance-based sizing cutoff that they have. It was a great paper um, from JVS back in 2012, so not new by uh, any mark, but um, it was discussing, it's by Dr. Kathleen Gibson and colleagues, uh, looking at great saphenous vein diameter and correlating with um, quality of life scores. And my, uh, I, I really enjoy the way that they've concluded it. Um, they say great saphenous vein diameter is a poor surrogate marker for assessing the effect of varicose, vein, uh, varicose veins on patient quality of life. Thus, using great saphenous vein diameter as a sole, sole criterion for determining medical necessity for the treatment of GSV reflux is inappropriate. And I think that's something that uh, whenever we're on a peer-to-peer -peer is always um, helpful to have written in, in the literature and stated so clearly. Well, if you can also, I guess, send the link, we can we can circulate to the participants too. Really, um, Dr. Turani, any does the um, the uh, years the filter in dwelling time, I should say, of the filter, does that make you go straight to a bigger sheath, or would you try it first with a um, you know retrievable kit, or do you have an algorithm when to go straight to a big sheath or not? Yeah, I think um, for. The dwell time is important. The tilt, I, I think less so. If it looks straight, even if it's been in there for a while, um, I'll still I'll try with the, the standard sheet. If it's tilting, um, then uh, tilting and it's been there for a long time, or just tilting, uh, that's when I'll go with the, the, the larger sheath. Um, okay. And that the filter does matter. Like Cook Select, I mean, I you know, those can come out like after five years, they come out very easily. Mm -hmm. But the Gunter Tulip, they tend to become very inflamed and inherent. And it was very hard to, uh, they just attach the wall with a fiber and sheath. So it's very hard. Yeah, usually after a year, I would probably put the 16 French sheath because uh, it gives me more option than just to use the 10 French cook uh, retrieval device for the, for the one that are within a year or so. Well, uh, yeah. Doctor, I'm, I'm going to ask you actually a question because I know you do robotic uh, removal. So, uh, so if the struts are sticking outside, um, do you actually cut them ahead of time and then remove and then open the cave and remove them? Um, um, no, not for the robotic. We didn't actually did it for the open. I had to do that for the open because we couldn't retrieve it endovascular. We always try endo first, of course. I think at more than ninety five percent of the time we can get it open. We can uh, we could do it endovascularly when they're really really hard. And yeah, I know. Then it's questions like why? Why do you want to do it? Uh, well, you know, this one was going into the duodenum and every time she was eating steak, it would get stuck in a, in a 33 year old. It's a miserable life to be in. So, and I couldn't do it um, 
uh, I couldn't do it. Uh, so I did it open, you know, I cut the struts out and then, and then retrieved it that way. But the robotic one was actually very, um, very more straightforward. What we had to do is we basically had to un, um, basically, you know, the hooks on it, um, was sticking outside and you have to sort of strain that hook before you can actually pull it out. So, cause you don't want to rip the vena cava. So that's the other trick cause we didn't have the plier. So we just had to uh, strain out the, 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 the hook, the struts before uh, removing from the IVC. Oh. Little tips and tricks, I guess. Well, this was a fantastic session. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was great to hear all the speakers and moderate with you, Dr. Lin. So uh, and we want to thank Cook Medical for the sponsorship. Um, any other announcements, Dr. Lin? Well, yeah, it looks like it's coming to an end tonight. And I want to thank everyone um, and for, for participating as well as, uh, um, you know, helping us promote Venus Health. As we know that March is Stephen T. Awareness Month and it's a public health initiative aim at raising awareness of this commonly occurring medical condition and its pay, uh, potentially fatal complications such as pulmonary embolus. So during the last hour, we learned about these new and exciting innovations um, for managing these complex meniscus disease from these experts, uh, vascular surgeons, and that could affect your uh, current and future practice. So I hope we all, I certainly learned a lot tonight. So I, I enjoyed chatting with all you. And um, with that, have a good evening, everyone, and take care. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank Thanks. You.